All right, happy Sabbath. Uh, this is a little bit different format. Uh, I'm not uh, uploading, the, I mean, live streaming on Dragon S. Roth, uh, you know, today, but I'll uh, have this recorded and upload it on Dragon S. Roth, okay, uh, later today. All right. We're stud still studying the restoration of the. We're study still studying the restoration of the temple, uh, restoration of the sanctuary, and uh, the restoration of the sanctuary, because the sanctuary has been trodden underfoot. All right, sanctuary has been trodden underfoot. Uh, remember, the first king that first trodden underfoot. Who's the first king of Judah that trodden underfoot the sanctuary? And then what did the, that king do? Right. The first king that trodden underfoot the sanctuary. Who was that? Do you remember? It was? Manasseh. Manasseh. That's right, R.C. It's Manasseh, <clears throat> right? It's in 677 BC, right? And what did he do? He put Baal idols in the sanctuary. Terrible. He put Baal idols in the sanctuary. Okay. And after that, because of that, he had to be taken away by the Assyrians and he was taken to Babylon. But he repented, so he came back. And that was what is going to be the fate of the the kingdom of Judah, because the kingdom of Judah had all bad kings as the, as the sons of Josiah, you know, Jehoahaz. He was uh, defeated by the, uh, the Egyptians. And then the other three sons was Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And they were defeated by the Babylonians, all right? And the temple was desecrated and burned down and uh, all the uh, riches was taken to Babylon, right? So the sanctuary was trodden underfoot. But God's people, the host, had been already trampled underfoot ever since the time of Hosea, the, the king of the 10 northern tribes, right? Okay, all right. Okay, so what we are going to see is how is the sanctuary trodden underfoot, right? Obviously, when the sanctuary is trodden underfoot because it is physically, uh, physically uh, uh, taken down, it's burnt, it is uh, not one stone upon on top of each other, all right? But then also, there's a spiritual meaning of the sanctuary being trodden underfoot, meaning the understanding or the truth of the sanctuary is trodden underfoot. Okay. All right. Let's turn on the volume. All right. Just want to make sure your volume. Oh, sorry. Here, the volume is down here. Okay. All right. Uh, Okay, can you can you hear? Yeah, it's, it's good. yeah, the volume is the volume is good. Okay, all right. Uh, so, what we want to do is study how to how to understand how the sanctuary is trodden underfoot all the all the uh, um, all the doctrine of the sanctuary is trodden underfoot yeah how is the doctrine of the sanctuary trodden underfoot okay all right how is the doctrine of the sanctuary trodden underfoot well obviously the repairers of the breach is actually not a true uh, true understanding of the not a true understanding of the uh, restoration of the temple.
because the breach is actually made in the in the walls, right? Right. The breach is made in the walls, but the walls are to protect the temple, right? So the people had to be prepared. They were prepared for 70 years in Babylon, and then they went back. And then they restored the then they restored the uh, and they restored the temple and took them 20 years under Zerubbabel and Joshua. Remember that? Okay. From 536 until 516, right? And then the services had to be restored. Who restored the services of the sanctuary? Who restored the services? If the temple physical building was restored by Zerubbabel and Joshua, who restored the services? Who restored the services, if you remember? All right, it was in the in the Ezra beginning? in the beginning, in the beginning. Who restored the services? It's Ezra, right? Because to have the services, you have to have priest, Levites, and Nathanims. And then who restored the walls and the streets? It was Nehemiah, all right? So Nehemiah repaired the breach in the wall, okay? But we have to also understand the repairers or the restorers of the sanctuary. That's why we uh, we're doing, uh, you know, specifically this, right? So we have the, this is the schematic or the schematic of the uh, sanctuary, uh, the outer court, uh, the holy place, and the most holy place. All right. Okay. Let me see if I get there red pointer here okay there you go outer court holy place and most holy place all right all right isaiah 58 verse 12. Um, you notice the format is a little different because this is part of an old old uh old uh, study that we had uh, which i i now had to uh, update you know this is an old the, the way i did my slides in the past but uh, i updated updated it because of uh, the things that we understand a little bit more about the sanctuary okay all right and they sh that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places right the old waste places is Jerusalem that is has been wasted and they shall raise up the foundations of many gener generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of paths to dwell in you restore the walls that are breached and the paths that's the streets right now this is actually talking about uh, should be talking about Nehemiah right but these walls and streets are to protect the sanctuary that has already been rebuilt. And also this, the, protect the services that's in the sanctuary. Okay. Uh, obviously, uh, Daniel 8.13, right? So who has, been, <laughs> who has been trotting underfoot, right? The horns have been trotting underfoot, God's uh, people. Uh, the God's people has been trodden underfoot. Uh, the horns, and we understand the four horns. It was what? Assyria. Who else? Egypt, Babylon, and Middle Persia, right? But it's, does it stop there? Obviously not. They continue to trodden underfoot. Who is afterwards? Greece, right? And then here, Daniel 8.13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? We all understand the daily sacrifice is pagan, paganism or pagan Rome, right? So how long shall pagan Rome and transgression of desolation is? Papal Rome, to trodden underfoot 
the sanctuary and the host. Okay, all right. So what we're understanding is, you know, this is this is uh, the Chao Zone vision is obviously starting from Middle Persia, but we always already already know it's uh, Babylon starts first. Babylon, and that's in Daniel two and Daniel seven, but in Daniel eight, the horns start with Middle Persia, right, and then Greece, right. And then you also have the horns of Papal Rome and Pagan Rome, right? And you know this diverse beast, right? This diverse beast had 10 horns on of it. It used to be the 10 horns of pap uh, the Pagan Rome, right? The Pagan Rome was conquered into 10, 10 toes, which is like 10 horns, right? But then one horn came up and plucked out three, right? So that, how many are left? There's eight. There's eight are left, okay? And how many horns are in the, how many horns are in the sanctuary? There's eight horns, right? There's eight horns. These are the horns that trodden underfoot <coughs> the sanctuary and the, Host, all right, okay, all right. So, how does the how how does the how does pagan Rome and papal Rome trodden underfoot the sanctuary? Okay, anybody want to you know how does the how does pagan Rome and papal Rome trodden underfoot the sanctuary? Obviously, I'm not talking about the physical not the physical building, right? How does pagan Rome and papal Rome trodden underfoot the sanctuary spiritually? Right? How does it trodden underfoot? How does it trodden underfoot the truth of the sanctuary, right? Okay, so we, when we understand the sanctuary, we understand all the symbols of the service, that is like the furniture and the function of the services, right? So how we see it is that pagan Rome and papal Rome will corrupt the understanding of all these furnitures and the services associated with it, right? The services and these furnitures will all be corrupted by, by, uh, by the papacy, okay? All right, uh, by Rome, okay? Pagan Rome and papal Rome. All right, let's start with the altar of burnt sacrifice. All right, how would you, uh, well, altar of burnt sacrifice is, obviously we, uh, we know it, uh, it represents the lamb, right? The lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, right? And it points to Jesus as the anti-typical lamb, which is the only way through which anybody can come to the Father, right? Right. So if you have, if you want your sins. If you want your, uh, to repent of your sins, you have to sacrifice a lamb, right? A lamb that is sacrificed in front of the, in front of the entrance to the, in front of the entrance to the uh, sanctuary, and then it's killed and then taken onto the altar of burnt sacrifice, and then burnt on the altar, correct? Right, yeah. it's burnt there. Okay. You didn't answer yet about the trampling. Yes, yes, I, I did. How is the, how is, how does papal Rome and pagan Rome trample underfoot the sanctuary? How does it do it? All right. 
let's repeat it again. How does it do it? It corrupts the understanding of the services, right? It corrupts the understanding of the services of the sanctuary, right? And all the furniture, everything about the understanding, the true understanding of the sanctuary is corrupted by pagan Rome and papal Rome, right? You see, because it's how long shall be the vision that the papal Rome and pagan Rome will trodden underfoot the sanctuary, right? How does it do it? It corrupts the understanding of the services of the sanctuary, okay? So we'll start with this service. How is this service corrupted by Rome? How is the altar of burnt sacrifice? If Jesus is the Lamb of God, and Jesus is the only way to get to the Father, right? For you to uh, repent of your sin. How does Rome corrupt that? It's actually not that difficult to see it. How does Rome corrupt the altar of burnt sacrifice? How does Rome do that? The ascension of the Roman church to, to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her, as her power increased, the darkness deepened. Faith was transferred from Christ, right? Faith is no longer in Christ, the true foundation, but is now transferred to who? To the Pope of Rome. In studying Instead of trusting in the Son of God for forgiveness of sin and eternal salvation, the people look to the Pope and the priests and the prelates, prelates, to whom he delegated authority. They were taught that the Pope was the earthly mediator, right? Jesus is no longer the way. The blood of Jesus is no longer the way into the holy place right into the most holy place how do you how do you uh, confess your sins yeah we know how we confess our sins right to the to the bishops and the earthly mediators right uh, he stood in the place of god to them and was therefore to be implicitly obeyed a deviation from his requirements for a sufficient cause for severe, severest punishment to be visited upon the bodies and the souls of the offenders. They were taught not only to look to the Pope as their mediator, but to trust in the works of their own to atone for sin. Right? The atonement is only done through the Lamb in the sanctuary, which points to Jesus. And atonement is only done through the blood of, of the Lamb, right? Okay. All right. So this, the altar of burnt sacrifice is corrupted by Rome, right? By, by substituting Jesus as the mediator, the Lamb, to the Pope. Okay. All right. Uh, what's next? What's next in the altar? Uh, in the in the after this in the in the courtyard? What's next? Obviously, it's the labor, right? Okay. What does the labor represent? What does the labor represent in the? What does the labor represent in the uh, in the sanctuary service? Yeah, purification, right? How how did? What else does it uh, represent? They have to wash with water. They have to wash their hands and feet so that they, don't, they do not die. What does, what does that mean also? Baptism. Baptism, that's right. They have to thank you, Duane, right? It is called, it's, it symbolizes baptism, right? Okay. All right. Not one shall be buried with Christ by baptism unless they are critically examined whether they have ceased to sin. 
whether they have fixed moral principles, whether they know what sin is, whether they have moral defilement which God abhors. Find out by close questioning if these persons are really ceasing to sin, if with David they can say, I hate sin with a perfect hatred. So if you want to be baptized, you know, during your baptismal class, you have to be taught what it means to sin. And you have to have an understanding eventually before you're baptized, the same as what David said, that he now has a perfect hatred for sin. Right? How is that? You know, you have to have an understanding what the law is, and you have to understand what sin is, right? To be able to be baptized. Okay? That's the understanding of the labor. Okay, how is that corrupted? How is that corrupted in the Catholic Church? It's not very difficult to see. How are you baptized? Babies are baptized. Do babies understand? Are babies given a Bible study so they can have perfect hate of sin before they are baptized? Why, why are babies baptized according to the Catholic doctrine of baptism? Why are babies baptized? Because they have what? Original sin, right? Because they have original sin. They have, when they are born, they already have sin. And whose sin is that? Where did they come from? Well, it, uh, according to the, the doctrine of the baptism of the Catholic faith, it is from Adam. And before they die, make sure they don't get sick and die, you have to baptize them so that they will be saved from their original sin, right? So the labor is corrupted, right? The labor is corrupted by the, the, the I guess, got to be the tradition, the tradition of bapti infant baptism, all right? Okay, so we're done at the, you know, this, this, uh, we, we know all of this already. It's just a review. It's just a review. Uh, but we'll add a, a few uh, more details that I think that we haven't uh, studied before. Okay. All right. Uh, let's now go to uh, the holy place. All right, the showbread. All right. The holy best to the right, to the north side is the showbread. And Jesus said, I am the, I am the bread of life. All right. Okay. So how is the, how is the bread of life corrupted by the, uh, by Rome? Jesus is the bread of life, which is the word of God. Right? Was, was the, the masses allowed to read their own Bible? They were not, right? The Bible was only to be read by the, uh, by, uh, by the bishops, right? Right? And the masses just had to be given the understanding of what the bishops gave them, right? But eventually, the masses were able to get a Bible after the Protestant Reformation, right? So what happened to the Bible when everybody now can read their own Bibles? What happened to the Bibles now? It had to be changed, right? So there's so many different versions of the Bible so that a lot of people are now confused. So now, the bread of life, which is the word of God, is now, is now, is now corrupted, right? 
Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deception and withstand his power. Right? It was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. Right? The Bible would exalt God and place infinite, fin finite men in their true position. Therefore, a sacred truth must be, must be concealed and suppressed by, the, uh, uh, by Rome. This logic was adapted, adopted by the Roman Church. For hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was interpreted, was prohibited. The people were forbidden to read it and have it in their houses. And unprincipled priests and prelates interpreted its teachings to sustain their pretensions. Thus the Pope came to become universally acknowledged as the vicegerent of God on earth, endowed with the authority over church and state all right yeah this is their bible right it's supposed to be very simple so that a lot of people can everybody can read it but now it becomes only uh only available for the for the uh for the bishops and the priests right Okay, what else in the what else is in the what else is in the holy place? Yeah, what else is in the uh, what is all else is in the holy place? Okay, the golden candlesticks. All right, uh, this is. Uh, uh, there, the understanding of this uh, just came uh, not long ago uh, of what the golden candlesticks is. is. All right. Remember when we did the, uh, the man on a red horse riding among the myrtle trees, right? Okay. That's a symbol of Jesus walking among the seven golden candlesticks all right the seven golden candlesticks and the seven lamps which give light over the candlesticks right and the seven lamps have to have oil so there's oil and there's the candlestick and there's the and there's the light all right it's not difficult to see that the oil is what's the symbol of the oil what does it symbolize? What does the oil symbolize? The spirit of? Spirit, spirit of, of Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. The oil is the Holy Spirit. The spirit of Jesus. And what is the light? What is the light? The light is the life of Jesus. Right? The light is the life. I am the light of the life. I am the light. Uh, I am the light. Right, I am the light of the world. Right, and the and uh, uh, the light is the life of Jesus. All right, and what about the golden candlestick? Right, the golden candlestick is is actually an almond tree. Right, yeah. Where did we have that? Okay, let me get that. Exodus twenty-five, and the candlesticks are four bowls made look made like unto almonds so the candlestick is like almonds right and what are what are almonds what where else do we find almonds in the in the sanctuary where's where else do we find almonds almonds is in the holy place but where else do we find almonds it's in the it's in the most holy place, and it's Aaron's rod that buddeth. And that, what does that symbolize? All right, this is a, just a review. What does the Aaron's rod that buddeth almonds symbolize? The faith of Jesus, right? So if the oil is the spirit of Jesus, and the almond tree is the faith of Jesus, and the uh, lamp is the life of Jesus, 
this whole thing represents Jesus, right? It all represents Jesus. Okay. All right. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. All right, let's see where I'm going with this. Great Controversy, page 60. But the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. Ah. The noon of the papacy, when the papacy was it's at supremacy, it was the midnight of the world. It was the dark ages, right? Because it took out the light of the sanctuary. It took out the understanding of Jesus. It took out the understanding of the word of God. It took out the Bible. The Holy Scriptures were almost unknown, not only to the people, but to the, but to the priests. Like the Pharisees of old, the papal leaders hated the light, which would reveal their sins. God's law, the standard of righteousness, having been removed, they exercised power without limit and practiced vice without restraints, right? It was in complete darkness. During, during that time, it is called the Dark Ages for a good reason, because Europe had made no progress in learning arts or civilization right? during that time. While the countries in the world, like China and Arabia, was excelling in what? Was excelling in mathematics, astrology, astronomy, right? India, all these, all these countries of the world was, was becoming uh, uh, more advanced, right? While Europe was deep into the dark ages, right? Okay, when the religious denominations unite with the papacy to oppress God's people, places where there is religious freedom will be opened by evangelistic canvassing. If in one place the persecution becomes severe, let the workers do as Christ has directed. So what happens is, when the, when the darkness came, and that's when the Protestant Reformation started, right? right to bring back the word of God, the Holy Scriptures, and the understanding right, of the sanctuary back. The symbols of the sanctuary and the services of the sanctuary had to be restored. Okay, all right. So we did the, uh, what? We did the uh, showbread. We did the uh, golden candlesticks. And now what else do we have? What's the next thing that we have? The altar of incense, right? right. But I have, to, I have to combine it with the altar of incense because like the almond tree, the almond is in the holy place, but also there's an almond in the most holy place, right? Okay, we have a golden, the altar of, uh, altar of incense and the golden censer. Now the altar of incense is where? in the holy place. Where is the golden censer? Well, it's actually used in the uh, holy place also, but it is mostly used in the most holy place, right? The golden censer is mostly used in the most holy place. Okay, all right. What does that mean? What does the altar of incense and golden censer represent? It represents Jesus hearing the prayer of the saints because it comes out as a as smoke coming up, right? As smoke. And Jesus adds his righteousness to the to the prayer so that it becomes so that it becomes acceptable to the Father. Right? So the smoke that comes from the altar of incense and the golden censer represents the prayer of the saints, okay? As they confess their sins, uh, as they ask for forgiveness, as they ask for blessings and they praise, praise God. 
Okay. Oh, but what do but what do the pagans say? How do they pray? How do the pagans pray? They peep and mutter, right? They peep and mutter. And that's how they do, right? And and peep and mutter, right? As and when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, unto, unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the for for the living to the dead, to the law and the testimonies? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Right? Yeah. There's no burning incense in them. Right? It has no light. When you peep and mutter, you are not praying to the to the Father through Jesus. Right? Okay. All right. So the golden censer, as we know, it has the, the smoke that comes out of it, which represents the prayer of the saints, right? And the golden censer is, the censer is where? Where is the golden censer in the most holy place? Where is it located? Where is it located? You know, in the holiest, I saw an ark and on top of, and and on the top and the sides of it was purest gold. On each end of the ark was a lovely cherub with their wings spread over it. Their faces were turned towards each other and they looked downward. Between the angels was the golden censer. So where is the golden censer in the, in the most holy place? It's actually on the mercy seat, right? The cherubs are like this. There's the mercy seat. There's the cherub. And where's the sensor? Right in the middle, right? Right there. That's the sensor. So that, that uh, you know, the prayers will go to the Father. All right? Okay. And obviously, that golden sensor is brought in by the, by Aaron, right? By the high priest, which represents, which represents Jesus. Okay. All right. Okay, let's see. So how is this corrupted? Let's see. How is this corrupted? Says the apostles, confess your faults one to another and pray one to another that ye may be healed. The scripture has been interpreted to sustain the practice of going to the priest for absolution. Right? but it has no such application. What do you have to do? When you pray, you confess your sins to God, who only can get, forgive them and your faults to one another. If you have given offense to your friend or neighbor, you are to acknowledge your wrong, and it is his duty freely to forgive you. Then you are to seek the forgiveness of God because the brother whom you wounded is the property of God. The case is not brought before the priest at all, but before the only true mediator. If you want to confess your sins, you pray to God, and the, your supplication is brought only through Jesus, right? It is not to be brought to the priest, right? The Catholic Encyclopedia, the Sacrament of Penance, I like this picture. Look at these people here. They're all in, in line here. They're all in line, waiting in line to, for what? For this person to, to confess the sin to this. Wow. Oh, this priest is just sitting there, right? Just listening yeah, to all the, all the confessions, right? The Council of Trent declares, okay, Council of Trent. So if you're, if you're, you're, if you're going to be asked what, what happened at the Council of Trent, the most important thing is that it instituted the sacrament of penance, right? Okay, according to the Council of Trent, right, the, the sacrament of penance 
after the resurrection of Jesus was a miracle greater than that of healing of the sick. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them, and he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. According to the Council of Trent, the consensus of all the fathers always understood that by the words of Christ just cited, when he says, this, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. It means that the power of forgiving and retaining sins was communicated to the apostles and their lawful successors. Christ granted the power to forgive sins to the apostles, and therefore, because the popes are direct, you know, in lineage uh, to the apostles, the popes can forgive sins right so that's uh, that's the altar of incense all right and uh, in the sanctuary where are the sins where are the sins recorded in front of the veil and the, and the blood is sprinkled onto the onto the altar of incense and how is the blood, I mean, how is the sins removed eventually so that it be, can be transferred to the, the goat, the live goat? How is it during the day of the day of atonement? How are the sins that is, has been transferred to the holy place, to the altar of incense, how is it transferred to the, to the goat? How is it transferred to the goat? What does the, what does the, what does the high priest have to do to transfer the sins that has been placed there all year long to the holy place onto the altar of incense? How is the sins transferred by the high priest to the, to the what? To the live goat? How is it done? How is it done? Anybody remember? How is it done? The Placing what? of hands on the goat's head. That's right. But how does it get to the hand of the high priest? How does it get to the hand of the high priest? Because his, his hand... He has to carry it so that he can put it on the goat. But how did, did that sin get on him? How was it transferred to him? How, how was it transferred to him? What did he have to do to the altar of incense? He touched the altar of incense, which had all the sins of the records of the sins of the people right so he touched the horn of the altar of incense and that's how the sins was transferred to him the touching represents transfer right so he touched the horn of the altar of incense and then he went to the live goat and then he touched the live goat that's how he transferred it right and it's done through the high priest can anybody do this no nobody can do this only the high priest meaning only jesus can do this right through his blood all right okay all right so now we go to the most holy place. This one is actually not that difficult. We, all, we always study this. Uh, the two tables of stone, which is the Ten Commandments, right? Right. 
we all we all we all know about the Ten Commandments, and there's the the Ten Commandments have been changed, uh, specifically the uh, the one is the most uh, commonly uh, studied is the Fourth Commandment being changed. All right, all right. But what else does the two tables of stone represent? Right? Yeah, we did last week. What does the two tables of stone represent? The two tables of stone represent the combination of divinity and humanity. Right? It also, because it represents the commandments to God and the commandments to men. Four commandments for God and four commandments six. for six. six commandments for for men, right? That's for God and men. And God and men are combined, right? So it's like, and the commandments for God first before the commandments for men, right? So the you know, man has to be sub submissive to the divinity, to the to, to God. Right, right. Just as the church is submissive to Christ, just as Christ is submissive to the Father, just as wives are submissive to the the husband. Right. That is the Ten Commandments. Right, right there. You see, to the government of God. But as as you, <coughs> you see, right. Uh, the tables of stone was was carved by Moses, and God said to Moses, "This is the second set, right? The second set." He says, "Okay, Moses, bring me two tables of stone, so that now I can write with my finger." So the tables of stone were the stones of men, and God's finger wrote on that those stones so it's the uh, the divinity of god writing in the human stone all right so that's divinity and humanity right that's like a marriage right and so how is this corrupted how is it corrupted because the the marriage is corrupted right the marriage is corrupted because now the 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 woman is no longer subject to the husband as a matter of fact the woman now goes and fornicates with another man right another it does not stay married to jesus he be, the the woman she becomes apostate and fornicates with the dragon power which is the state with the government with the kings and rulers, right? And in Revelation 17, verse 3, And he carried me away into the spirit of wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet, scarlet colored beast, right? This is the woman, which is the beast, sitting on top of the dragon right here, right? The scarlet colored beast is actually the dragon, symbol of the dragon, right? This woman, is not submissive to the dragon. The beast is not submissive. The beast actually controls the dragon, right? This is a perverted marriage. This is a perverted church and state relationship, right? And what is it called? It is the image, right? Sorry, it is not the image to the beast. It is the image of the beast right but what is the image to the beast how is it formed when the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accept hidden rights and customs she lost the spirit and power of god right and in con and in order to control the conscience of the people she sought the support of the secular power she made a image of the beast right the result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it further 
to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. There you go. Punishment of heresy. This is the image of the beast. This is a corrupted what? It's a corrupted church and state relationship, right? Okay. So that's how the Ten Commandments uh, is corrupted, right? Okay. All right. Let's go. Oh, obviously, I, I, I. I didn't put that, but uh, we always put that the Ellen White's uh, Ellen White's um, vision of how she saw the Ten Commandments, and uh, one that had a halo around it was the Fourth Commandment, and that has been corrupted by uh, by the papacy, right? By uh, by not only papacy, right? By pagan Rome also. Right. Okay. Right. Now the golden pot of manna. Now this is where it becomes a little bit more interesting. What is the symbol? What does the golden pot of manna symbolize? We we've done this many times already. What does the golden pot of manna symbolize? What does the golden pot of manna symbolize? What, oh, what? What does the golden pot of manna symbolize? The health message. Health message. Okay. My question is, how did pagan Rome and papal Rome corrupt the health message? How, the, how did pagan Rome and papal Rome corrupt the golden pot of manna, right? Not that I'm saying that the golden pot of you know it, you know, it, can you can you reconcile this? How did pagan Rome and papal Rome corrupt the golden pot of manna, which if it represents only health reform? All right, I just, I'm just giving you a clue of what my line of thinking is. It has to represent something else other than the health reform message all right okay this is where it becomes interesting because this is something that after studying this i just figured out within this last week what it means okay the golden pot of manna all right let me see okay in the book of revelation where do you have manna where is manna in the book of Revelation? Where is the book in the book of Revelation? Where do you see manna in the book of Revelation? All right, I'm gonna show you. If you're, you're looking in the Bible, where's the where's the manna in the book of Revelation? It's in Revelation two. Right, verse 12 and 17. I'm going to read it to you. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword and with two edges. Okay, jump to verse 17. Now, what happens, the church of Pergamos, you know, there are people who were overcome at the time of the church of Pergamos, right? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the what? The hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Okay, what is the hidden manna that is eaten by those who overcome during the, the dispensation of the Church of Pergamos. All right. What is the hidden manna? Okay. For one thing, what does the Church of Pergamos represent? What time period does that represent? Okay. Anybody want to answer? I'll let anybody answer. 
who wants to answer? What does the Church of Pergamos represent? What does the Church of Pergamos represent? Anybody? Anybody want to answer? What is Church of Pergamos? It's a It's a amalgamation of pagan and Christian. There's a compromise, a compromise of truth and error. Pergamus is a compromise of truth and error. This is where Constantine decided that decided that. that he is going to that he is going to what that he is going to that Constantine is now going to uh, get baptized, right? A mass baptism of all, all, his, all his soldiers. They're all going to get all baptized. They are all going to be, become uh, Christian, right? And all the pagan uh, traditions were then combined with Christian doctrines and because of that it, you know came out the papal church right which is actually baptized paganism right baptized paganism and those who overcome that compromise eat the hidden manna okay so what is the hidden manna all right. What is what does manna mean anyway? Food. Right. It's actually food. Right. Right. Hidden manna. Right. It is manna is the true bread from heaven. heaven. Right. For the bread of God is the is Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, "I am the manna." Okay. So my question is, what is the hidden manna during the time of Pergamos? It's, it's the word of God, it's the Bible that was hidden. Right, yeah. It's the Bible, the word of God, Jesus, is hidden. All right? I'm trying to lead you here, right? Okay, so you, what happens is, during the time of Pergamos, Jesus is actually hidden, right? Mm -hmm. And how is Jesus hidden? Okay, we're going to find out during the time of Pergamos. Because those who believe in the true Jesus, which is actually hidden, will overcome. Right? This is the hidden manna during the time of Pergamos. And we know Pergamos is the church of the church during the time of Constantine. From the time of Constantine all the way until the time of after Pergamos is what church? What's the church after Pergamos? In the no, no. Pergamos and then Thyatira. When does Thyatira start? Five thirty-eight. When the when the papacy becomes supreme, and Thyatira goes from five thirty-eight until the Protestant Reformation. Right, five thirty-eight until the Protestant Reformation. So Pergamos is from uh, the baptism of Constantine until 538 okay that's pergamus okay all right all right what does jesus say you know so uh i picked some verses that specifically shows who jesus is right according to jesus own testimony because this is what jesus himself said right he said the sabbath is made for men and not man for the sabbath Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. What did Constantine do in 321? Change the uh, Sabbath to Sunday. That's right. So he hid Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. So he hid the manna, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So that's what Constantine did, right? Okay, let's see. What's another one? 
All right. Jesus said in John 16, verse 25 to 29. I like this one, you know. A lot, not very many people read, uh, understand this. Right? This is Jesus' own testimony. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall mm -hmm. show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I come out of the Father. And I come out from God. I come forth from the Father. And I come, come to the world. I leave the world and go to the Father. And what did his disciples say? Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. You say you come out of God, and you come forth from the Father? The disciples say, that is not a proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. But this we believe, that thou comest forth from God. God. Right? Literally. And Literally. Is this a proverb? No. no. Absolutely not. It is literal. Okay. All right. My question is, when did this happen during the time of Pergamos? I have the I have the schematic here. I have the the whole when did when did pagan Rome when did pagan Rome say that Jesus did not come out of the Father during the time of Pergamos? Mm -hmm. Three twenty-five. Absolutely. Thank you, Brother Drain. Three twenty-five. <laughs> The Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea, right? Yeah. Here, it, it hid the hidden manna. It hid the manna right here. Jesus was hidden here as the Lord of the Sabbath at the time of Sunday law. This is, the, this is, when, this is when the daily sacrifice trodden underfoot the sanctuary. It trodden underfoot the bowl of manna, right? And that bowl of manna is now hidden. So only those who can eat of that hidden manna will overcome, right? It trodden underfoot, what? The, the Lord of the Sabbath. And also in Council of Nicaea, Council of Nicaea, there's two main things. One is the consubstantiality of Jesus. What does consubstantiality of Jesus mean? Uh, they are one substance, right? Oh yeah. They are of one substance, meaning Jesus had no beginning. If Jesus has no beginning, then Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. The Father. If Jesus is called eternal of the Father, can Jesus come out literally out of the Father? No. This is how the, the manna is hidden, right? So the daily sacrifice, which is paganism, trodden underfoot the manna. In 321, with the Sunday law and the consubstantiality of Jesus at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, right? And because they did that, what happened to them? Right? They became weak, right? Because they were attacked by who? The trumpet powers. Trumpet power, yeah. If you do these things, if you do these things, you know, you make the Sunday law, and you try, uh, and you, uh, you know, you trodden underfoot Jesus. 
what's going to happen to you? You're going to be punished with punished. the trumpet power, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, the trumpet powers are the, the four trumpet powers are the gas, the the gas, the what? The vandals. The vandals. The Huns and the Heroli, right? Heroli. So you get punished with the the four trumpets, all right? So that the, then you are you are uh, you are you are beca you become the ten toes, right, of Rome, okay? But these ten toes become a menace, right? They keep they keep menacing uh, Western Rome, right? So then Western Rome was divided into Western Rome here and Eastern Rome, which is the Byzantine Empire, right? Byzantine, yeah. During the Byzantine Empire, right? And three of these, three of these Ghost. trumpet powers, right? Yeah. Kept harassing, kept harassing Rome, right? And their Heroli, the Vandals and the Asargoths, right? So what happens? Justinian elects Pope John II as what? In 533. Corrector of heretics. The corrector of heretics. Who are the heretics? The trumpet powers of Heroli, Vandals, and Asargas. Why are they heretics? Because they keep us up. There's another They're anti-Trinitarian. They are not Trinitarian, right? They are Arians. They don't believe in the Trinity because they're Arians. The, you know what? Rome is Trinitarian, and these three do not believe in the Trinity, and that's why they're Arians. Yeah, just, you know? And so what happens? They now can be plucked out, right? So you can pluck out these heretics, right? You can pluck out these heretics. And because of that, now the church can start making a Sunday law again. But this time, it's not Constantine that makes a Sunday law. Who makes a Sunday law? This is pagan Rome making Sunday law. Who's making the Sunday laws here? This is the Sunday law here, okay? This is a Sunday a symbol for a Sunday law. Who makes the Sunday law in this dispensation? Papal Rome. Papal Rome with the councils, specifically the, the there's many Orleans councils, right? There's many of them. But the biggest one is the Council of Orleans in 538. And what does this Council of Orleans in 538 say? That you cannot work on Sunday, right? You're not allowed to work on Sunday. The Council of Orleans in 538, that's a type of Sunday law, all right? Okay. The amazing thing is, what happens? What happens? After you make a Sunday law and you pluck out the heretics, right? What happens to you? You have to be punished. How are you punished? Amazingly, three years later, there's a, the largest plague mm -hmm. up until that time that was first recorded in history. This is the first time that the bubonic plague was recorded in history. 541 is called the Justinian plague. The bubonic plague hit three years after they successfully plucked out three horns and made a Sunday law. So the plagues happen after plucking out heretics and making a Sunday law. Then you get a what? You get plagues, and it's a what kind of plague? It's an infectious disease plague, right? 
Where does it come from? The rats. Animals. Animals. Right? It's called pestilence. Right? Mm. But who else was a heretic now? There's another heretic. Now these are the four trumpets. Who is now the heretic that is God sent to punish Rome? After the fourth trumpet comes the what? The fifth trumpet. What's the fifth trumpet? That comes Islam. out. It's Islam, right? Muhammad comes out, right? Muhammad comes out. During this time, Muhammad comes out, right? They have an issue here. Focus, which is the Byzantine Empire emperor, decides that he's going to allow Pope Boniface III becomes the universal church leader, right? Another corrector of our heretics, because they know there, you know, there's another heretic that is going to. They're going to, they're going to attack them, right? They're going to attack them. There's another heretic. The fifth trumpet is against Rome too, and it's Islam. It's another heretic, right? Why it takes so long from 541 to 606, like 60 years later, God sent the trumpet powers, not like before. It seems like only a couple of years after. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it, it does. I guess it's it does take time, you know. Uh, it's it's not that uh, I I don't I don't think I can explain that, mm -hmm. uh, but that's exact uh, that's exactly what happens, mm -hmm. right? But that's a trumpet power starts in 606, right? Right. Mm -hmm. That trumpet power decides to wait because during that time, there is a big, long war between Byzantine Empire and another heretic called the Sassanid Empire under Chosro, under Chosro here, right? There's another. What's amazing about the Sassanid Empire? What religion did they have? Did they have? It's not Islam. Okay, what religion did they have? Fire worship. Zoroastrianism. This is the this is the 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 religion of the original Persian kings, right? The the the, the, the Sassanid Empire. They they had they believe in Zoroastrianism and they believe in Ahura Mazda. Okay, what is so unique about Zoroastrianism? How many gods do they believe in? One God. This is a monotheistic religion, right? Zoroastrianism is a monotheistic religion. So what's what's wrong? What's wrong with this heretic here? Islam. One God. They also believe in one God. Do you see a pattern here somehow? Right? There's a pattern here. And will this be repeated in the end time? <laughs> it's going to be repeated again in the end time, right? Okay. And because of this problem here, these heretics who believe in one God, this heretic that believes in one God here, right? The emperor, the dragon, has to ask the beast to become the corrector of heretics. Okay. In the meantime, they are fighting. Rome was fighting against the Sassanid Empire, Heraclius. Eventually, there was such a long war. I think it was like more than 20 years. It was a very long war. And eventually, Heraclius won at the Battle of Nineveh. And the, and the reason for that battle was because the Sassanid Empire actually went into Jerusalem, defeated Jerusalem, went into the church of the sepulcher, went in there and took out the cross, the, the holy cross. They took out that cross and that was very sacred to the Catholic church. They said, okay, in that case, what shall we do? We will have a holy war against 
against the Sassanid Empire. We want our cross back. So when they defeated, Heraclius defeated Chosro at the Battle of Nineveh, they got their cross back and they returned it to Jerusalem, right? Right? They returned the, the you know, the, the cross back to Jerusalem. Okay. The Battle of Nineveh was 6, 627, all right? And when they were able to do that, when they were able to pluck out the, uh, the, the heretics of the Sassanid Empire, they decided at the Council of Toledo, the Eighth Council of Toledo in 653, they decided to make another more decisive Sunday law, right? And what was the, what was the decision at the Council of Toledo? What did they decide? Remember, the Council of Orleans, they said, you cannot work on Sunday. All right, what about the Council of Toledo? What's the Council of Toledo in 653? What type of Sunday law is that? What type of Sunday law is that? If you go to church on Sabbath, you are put to death. Right? Sun, Sunday or Sabbath? Oh. No, no. If you go to church on Sabbath, you are put to death. This Sunday law here is what? You have to stop working on Sunday. This Sunday law, this Sunday law, that it says, if you go to church on Sabbath, you are put to death. Is it different? Yes, it's very different. This is a type of, is a type of image of the beast test. This is now an image to the beast test, right? All right. Okay. All right. And what happens because of that? Well, already Islam has been attacking. Rome attacks, Rome gets attacked by the trumpet power, right? Starting in 629, actually, 629. See, the, these councils, there's many councils, but these councils are actually something that is a progressive the, the 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 decision to actually put the Jews in jail and uh, killing them was a progression progression of multiple councils. First, you cannot marry a Jew. Uh, the other one, you cannot buy or sell with Jews. And then eventually, the Jews who practice their religion and worship on the Sabbath is is actually uh, killed. Right, so it's all a progression, but we see, even though this group of heretics is defeated, this group of heretics here, the Muslims were not defeated. As a matter of fact, the Muslims continued to punish Rome. Right, these heretics, the 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 heretics of the heretic of the fifth trumpet of the Muslims continued to punish Rome. From 629, they punished Rome. And they, they, they delivered the first woe. And under the sixth trumpet, they delivered the second woe. All right? And if the first woe and the second woe is Islam, what do you think the third woe is? Islam. It's Islam also. And obviously, that's going to happen in our time. Right? So all of these things, you know, the time of the... Pergamus, this is Pergamus right here, right? From, from the time of Constantine until 538 is Pergamus, right? The hidden manna is what? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the true son of God. Jesus is the Lord of Sabbath, right? If you eat that hidden manna, you will overcome, right? But that manna is hidden by by the compromised church right wow it's pretty amazing so how does the how does the how does the 
daily sacrifice trodden underfoot the bowl of manna uh, the bowl of manna the sanctuary by hiding jesus right as the lord of sabbath and the true literal son of god right so there we have two du there's dual meanings right right the bowl of manna is also health reform right but it's actually symbolized the hidden understanding of jesus as the true son of god the true literal son of god and the lord of the sabbath all right okay all right okay let's see where are we how are we doing with time okay one turn here okay all right uh boy wow uh you know, I guess I can. We can continue next week, and then we'll go with uh, we'll go with uh, the we'll go with the uh, how the Protestant Reformation and the Adventist Church uh, restored the sanctuary, right? Restored the sanctuary that the. Uh, okay, let me say, before I do that, before we finish here, let me just go with one more slide, All right? But I think we, we will end it uh, with this slide, and then we'll continue next week, all right? Okay, Great Controversy, page 53. In the early part of the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. The Day of the Sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects, was honored by Christians. It was the emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism and Christianity. It amalgamated heathenism with Christianity. Right? He was urged to do this by the bishop of the church. Oh, it's the church that urged him. <laughs> right? Ah, right? It's the church, right? And it's always the woman. It's the woman that that caused Haman to make a, a gallow to hang Mordecai, right? All right. But while many God-fearing Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord and observed it in obedience to the fourth commandment. The arch deceiver had not completed his work. He was resolved to gather the Christian world under his banner and to exercise his power through his vicegerent, the proud pontiff. So now we go to the pontiff. Who's now? This is now the papacy, right? This is 538 on. This is now during the time of Thyatira now. Okay? We see. The, because if we can see these are the councils of what? Orleans and Toledo. Remember. Orleans and Toledo, 538, right? 653, right? Two different Sunday laws, right? The Sunday law is actually when you are put in jail and killed because of Sabbath keeping, right? But before that, there's another, it's a, the first part is a type of Sunday law where you are not to work on Sunday, okay? Right? That's Orleans. Toledo is you go to jail for keeping the Sabbath. All right? Okay. The proud pontiff who claimed to be the representative of Christ, through half converted pagans, ambitious prelates, and world loving churchmen, he accomplished his purpose. Vast councils. There was many, many councils. I'm, I can't remember. I think there's like 13 councils of Toledo. There's a so many councils of Orleans. There's, but we picked and choose the ones that are, had very significant, uh, significant rulings about the Sabbath. Okay. Vast councils were head, held from time to time, in which the dignitaries of the church were convened from all over the world. In nearly every council, the Sabbath which God had instituted was pressed down. Right. A little lower while the Sunday was correspondingly exalted. Thus the pagan festival came finally to be honored as a divine institution. 
while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism, and its, ob and its observers were declared to be accursed. Right? All right. Okay. So, well, uh, this is a study that we've actually done many years ago, but we are able to update it, right? And I, I'm hoping uh, you learned something today. I, I certainly did by re update uh, by updating this study because now I understand the bowl of manna, right? The, the bowl of manna is not only a health reformation, but the Jesus that represents the hidden manna that was hidden by the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, right? That had to be, that has to be restored. All right. Okay. Any any uh, additions, comments, or questions?